So if we come in for a trauma assessment patient, we get some type of dispatch information, pedestrian struck, going about 50 miles an hour. We arrive on scene, we're told that police have secured traffic for us. We find our patient, we see him lying supine. So we start our situation off, scene safety BSI, number of patients, I have one patient, mechanism of injury, pedestrian struck by vehicle going about 15 or so miles per hour. We'll try to check the car for any type of damage for sample history. Police are on scene, we'll request additional resources. We're going to want uh, police, fire, ALS activated at this time. So we'll get them en route to us. I'm gonna direct my partner to take in line of mobilization of C-spine. As I approach, I'm looking for my general impression. So I'm looking to see if there's any signs of deformity, any type of major life hemorrhage, anything that I would need to direct my attention to uh, outside of my normal ABC assessment. So prior to touching the patient, my partner has in line of mobilization of C-spine. I'm gonna call out to my patient to see if they're responsive to verbal stimuli. Sir, can you hear me? No response. I'm gonna try for some painful stimuli. No response there. I've now made a determination that my patient is unresponsive. So with that, I'm gonna move up, working around my partner holding in line of mobilization of C-spine. I'm gonna open up the airway with a modified jaw thrust since this is a trauma patient. I'm now going to look inside the airway. I'm looking for gurgling respirations, any signs of uh, fluid, vomitus, blood, broken teeth, anything like that that may require suctioning. So I'm checking for patency. At this time, the airway is patent. And since the patient is unresponsive, they're not able to protect their own airway. So we're gonna measure from the tip of the ear to the corner of the mouth, and this is where now we're going to size and insert our OPA. So we're gonna come in at a 90 degree angle. We're gonna rotate into the flanges flush with the lips, and we're gonna make sure that our patient has no intact gag reflex and accepts, accepts our OPA. At this time, they accept our OPA, so we've completed our airway assessment, and we're gonna move on to the chest for our breathing assessment. We're going to expose. We needed to remove clothing to be able to inspect. I'm looking at the chest, so I'm looking for any signs of decap BTLS, any deformity, contusions, paradox commotion, indicating flail segments, open sucking wounds that we'd have to put our gloved hand over and cover with an occlusive dressing. I'm looking to see if I have symmetrical chest rise. I'm going to palp down the sternal body to check if it's intact. I'm going to press on the ribs. I'm checking for the integrity of the thoracic cavity, checking to see if I have any broken ribs or flail segments. So I'm gonna do this over an inspiratory and expiratory phase. I'm going to listen with my stethoscope and we're going to auscultate over an inspiratory and expiratory phase determining the rate, rhythm, and quality of our breathing. Our patient's breathing 36 times a minute and shallow, so we're going to determine that that's inadequate. Our lung sounds are clear at this time. So at this time, we've already you know, uh, secured our airway. We're now going to direct our partner to ventilate our patient with the BVM one breath every six seconds attached to high flow oxygen and we want them to deliver that breath just until we see good adequate chest rise then we'll know we have good tidal volume we're going to reassess with our partner about our bag compliance make sure that it stays easy to bag if there's any tightness we want to know about that right away and now that we've looked we've palpated we've determined the rate rhythm and quality of our breathing we've determined our our oxygen assessment we're going to ventilate with a bvm at this time now we're going to move on to our circulation so i'm going to check for a carotid and a radial pulse at the same time we check a carotid for a good central pulse and a radial for perfusion so at this time they're both present my radial is weaker than my carotid so we've got a rate of about 108 so we know that the patient's already a little bit tacky. My radio pulse is diminished, so we're starting to have some issues with perfusion. And at this time, I want to also determine my skin vitals. So I'm touching the patient. If we have them exposed, checking the belly also for warmth. And this is where now we make a determination that our patient is pale, cool, and diaphoretic. Those skin signs, along with the tachycardia, along with the patient being unresponsive, we've already determined that this patient is high priority, but we've also made a determination that our patient is starting to show us outward signs of shock. So we want to make sure that if they have any wet clothes, we're getting those off. We're starting to get them covered and we're coming up with a plan to get our long board over to us so we can start to get this patient up and off scene. So the last thing for circulation is I'm going to do an anterior check, see if there's any type of bleeding that might need to be dealt with at this time. If there's nothing anterior, I'll do a click sweep with my gloves. And this is where now I'm coming in and we're looking at my gloves as I come out is there any blood because if there's blood on my hands we want to go back and visit if I just sweep down and there's blood on my hands now I don't know where I've made that determination so once we've determined that we have no blood return on our circulation sweep we've completed our ABCs this is where we'll make a transport decision this patient is high priority 
We want to minimize our scene time, our longboard's coming towards us. So as we're getting that set up, I'm going to do a very quick rapid assessment looking for additional life threats. So I'm checking the back of the head, any deformities, crepitus. I'm checking behind the ears for battle signs, any bruising or discoloration. I'm checking the pupils to see if they're pearl. Do I have a blown pupil, some type of head injury? Is there any fluid or blood coming from the nose? Is the patient still accepting my OPA? Do I need to suction at this time? Do we still have good bag compliance? So I want to reassess all of my primary assessments as we come through. So we want to make sure that we're remanaging anything that we've already taken care of. I'm checking the back of the neck for step-offs. I'm checking for JVD and tracheal deviation. None of those are found. We'll go ahead. We're going to size from the trapezius to the angle of the jaw. And this is where now we're going to size and apply our cervical collar and we're going to make sure that that sits on the patient on bare skin so that way if we manipulate clothing we're not manipulating c-spines we have that in place even though i have that collar in place my partner cannot let go of c-spine until we have them immobilized with head blocks so they're going to maintain c-spine immobilization we now have a collar in place we're going to come back we're going to reassess the chest even though we just did it if we have a life threat to our breathing, we want to make sure that we're reassessing this as often as possible so that we catch it. A lot can happen to a patient in five minutes. So we come back, we have them exposed, we pipe down the sternal body, making sure that there's no damage to the integrity, checking the stability. Flail segments are a late sign, so we're looking to see if anything's developed. Again, over an inspiratory, expiratory phase. Is there any new discoloration or a deepening of discoloration if we had any? And at this time, we'll re auscultate lung sounds seeing do we have clear lung sounds, have they started to become diminished, do we have absent lung sounds and a development of attention pneumothorax. So at this time everything remains clear, our partner is still ventilating so we want to confirm with them do we still have good bad compliance and when we look do we still see good chest rise with ventilation. Okay, So we're still ventilating the patient about 10 times a minute, one breath every six seconds with good chest rise and equal clear lung sounds with ventilation. So now we're going to move on to the abdomen, we'll divide into our four quadrants. So we're using our umbilicus as our divider. And this is where now you wanna go in either a clockwise or a counterclockwise method. I don't wanna jump quadrants because I'm checking to see are there any signs of internal bleeding. Normally the abdomen should be soft, non-distended. That's what we would like to see. Do I feel any warmth to the belly? Is there any discoloration? Do we have any distension or rigidity in any or all of these quadrants? That would be indicative of some type of internal bleeding. This patient needs surgery, that's a life threat, which is why we do this primary assessment. We're still looking for life threats. That's a life threat. We need to get going to the hospital. When we come to the pelvic girdle, we're pushing in and down at the same time. So inward to give us stability and downward. If it's instable, you know, aren't stable, we're going to come in with a pelvic binder. If it's stable, we're going to leave it alone, all right? But the pelvic is an area where we can lose a lot of blood. So if it's unstable, it's going to stay unstable. If it's stable, it should stay stable unless you do something bad to your patient. But this is where when we come back to reassess, we're reassessing for blood collection. Do we have, you know, asymmetry on one side where one side is collecting blood more as a warm to the touch? Male patients, we're checking for prior prism, that's a sustained erection indicative of a spinal cord injury. It's a terrible finding. So this is something that we're looking for. Are they incontinent of urine feces? If we have a female patient, do we have vaginal bleeding? Do we have rectal bleeding on any of our patients? So we're looking at any signs of uh, fluid volume loss. Get the amount of wet clothes, right? Wet contributes to our patient now becoming cold, which contributes to hypothermia and a poor outcome for our trauma patient. So making sure that we don't have any of those things, we're now circumferentially going around and offsetting our femurs. Femurs again, we can lose a lot of blood in those cavities, so we're looking for do we have any damage to the bones, any deformities, do we have any blood collection. Once we've completed down to our knees, we've completed our rapid trauma assessment. We're going to continue to look at the lower extremities, do I see any injuries? Deformities, angulations, bleeding, anything that I should manage before we start to move this patient. If it's something minor, we'll deal with that in the ambulance, but otherwise, if I have resources, I can direct a partner to take care of that, or at least I have an idea before I roll the patient. Upper extremity, same thing. I'm checking the shoulder girdles. Do we have any abrasions, lacerations, anything that I need to deal with, any deformities? And then I want to compare my radial pulses at the same time. So we always want to compare pulses bilaterally, see if they're equal, do they match? Is one side weaker than the other? And we can always go back and check our carotid pulse. Is that stronger than our, our radial here? 
So once we've come and we've checked our anterior, we want to get ready to log roll this patient. So our board has arrived, and this is where we'll log roll the patient to the least affected side. So if I had an injury to the chest, I'd want to go to the opposite side. If I have you know, injuries that are all sustained, this was a pedestrian struck and they get hit on the left side, then we'd let, ideally be rolling this patient on the right side as to not further complicate or cause any additional injuries to that side. So here, our patient has no injuries. We're gonna put this arm up. This is gonna help when we roll them. That head's gonna rest in the arm so their face isn't in the dirt. Always on the head man's count, so we still have our partner on uh, C-spine mobilization at the head. They make the call, everybody else follows suit. So ideally, with at least you know uh, another three people, along with the head man here, we'll have somebody here, we'll interlock our arms at the pelvis and at the lower extremities, and I'll have my arm up at the shoulders. That way here, when we bring this patient up, we have a barrier where they're up against us. We're not rowing them away from us, where they're gonna, we can push them right over. And so now on the head man's count, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna ro log roll this patient up towards us. So one, two, three, patient rolls up. We're gonna check the back of the head. Any deformities, anything we missed, the collar is in place. So we've been looking through the cervical uh, window if there's one for the posterior. We're going to have the back exposed and we're gonna palpate down the vertebrae. So if there is any damage to the vertebrae, I wanna count the vertebrae on my way down so that way I can come back and say, oh, there was you know, deformity or tenderness at you know, T4, T5, wherever that might be. But if I just go down and then there's a problem, you've gotta come back and count your way. So walk your hands down and count the vertebrae. Make sure there's no incontinence, there's no injuries that we missed with our patient laying supine, there's nothing we need to manage. And then again, on the headman's count, we now have the log uh, board in here. We're gonna roll the patient on the headman's count, one, two, three, and we're going to immobilize them on the long board. So this is where now we'll make sure they're fully immobilized. They're gonna have straps at the chest, at the pelvis, the knees, ideally above the knees, put padding to keep them in a neutral position. We're gonna have head blocks, so now my partner can let go of inline immobilization of C-spine, and our patient now is fully immobilized. We'll try to get any sample history from the accident. The car, do we have any information from a, a wallet with information on it? Is there any registration in the vehicle? Did anybody know any of the bystanders? So we'll try to get that. Again, not delaying our transport, but anything we can get before we leave the scene. Back in the ambulance, I'm gonna ask for my baseline set of vitals while we turn on the heat. We're gonna keep our patient warm, treating for shock, so turn the heat up as much as we can in the back of the ambulance. Warm packs, blankets, out of wet clothing. And now we want to get a blood pressure. So if our blood pressure is, you know, 82 over, you know, 54, skin vital is still pale, cool diaphoretic, pulses are 110, our respiratory rate, urea also take lung sounds, you know, and now lung sounds remain clear, our partner's still ventilating the patient. So at this time here, we're treating our patient for shock. We're gonna start, we can do our head to toe assessment where we can do our more detailed assessment, starting at the head, working all the way down, looking for uh, insignificant injuries that now if we have the time we can treat. Reassessing all of our major interventions, certainly our airway, do we need to suction? Do they accept our OPA? Do we have any changes in lung sounds? Do we have any bleeding or internal bleeding that we're starting to develop? So all of those things we're gonna aggressively monitor at least every five minutes on the way to the hospital. This is a high priority patient, so we're gonna take this patient to a level one trauma center. And then upon arrival at the trauma center, we're gonna transfer care to an equal or higher healthcare provider. So the most important thing when we're doing these assessments, a systematic approach, make sure that we're not missing anything. Um, it's easy to come in when you have distracting injuries and be like, oh, look at that leg or look at this arm over here that's twisted the wrong way. You need to come in and check out those ABCs do those interventions first. Any critical patient, we want to be calling for ALS, making sure that we have um, you know, additional resources on the way. If for no other reason, we're gonna need more people in the back to be able to do all of these interventions on this patient. Then we don't want to delay care the golden hour from the time of the injury to the time they're on the operating room table. We want that to be one hour or less. So it's not you know, the time that we show up and we're at the patient's side. This is where now, if the patient got injured, it took us 10 minutes to get there, we're 10 minutes on scene, and we have a 10 or 20 minute transport to the trauma center, we're already 30 or 40 minutes into this timing. So getting these patients to the hospital, the most important intervention for these multi-system trauma patients is gonna be transport. So we wanna make sure that we get that done as soon as possible, all right? So hopefully this is helpful. This is one of those things you just gotta memorize. The most important tool you have as a healthcare provider at any level is a good systematic approach, being able to go through, 
find your life threats, understand the information you're getting from your assessment, understanding the diagnostics, it's not enough to just get a blood pressure, hand over the, you know, the systolic and diastolic to the nurse, you need to understand what does that tell you. Is it telling you this patient's in compensated shock? Have we already switched over to decompensated shock? How aggressive do we need to be with our management? When you truly understand the signs and symptoms, good systematic approach, you understand the diagnostics, you can come in and you can take care of any patient no matter how sick or how injured. And that's what these patients need, especially in the pre-hospital setting. All right? So feel free to go through. We've got the trauma sheets posted. Check out our website, Diesel Therapy Academy, for other resources and videos. And we'll see you next time. Take care.